So um, I'm Matisha, and I'm going to be presenting with my colleague Simeon today. And this Teach Me is all about surviving your trainee teacher placement. So most of you will have either started or will be starting your second placements. And so this event is going to cover how you can balance your coursework and placements, how you can gather evidence for the teacher standards and also for your coursework as well, how to develop a good relationship with parents, group work, behavior management, and also developing your teaching practice. So this session will last around 40 minutes and there will be time for questions at the end, but feel free to just pop any questions as they come to you in the chat. And our team will be providing links. So Harriet will be providing any links that relate to what we're talking about. And that might be resources, blogs, podcasts, and that will all be in the chat. And again, like Louise said, it will be sent to you at the end of the session anyway. And we will ask for your thoughts and ideas at certain points. So feel free if you want to, you could type your response in a chat or if you'd like to answer, you can answer. But if you'd rather not speak, then you can also just put your answer in the chat and that's absolutely fine. So yeah, we'll get started. So just a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Matisha and I was a teacher for seven years. And throughout my time in school, I taught throughout Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2, and I spent three years in Year 6. And I also have some experience in supply teaching as well. So I'm part of the Trainee Teachers and ECTs team at Twinkle, and I create videos for our YouTube channel, and I also support Trainee Teachers and ECTs on our Facebook groups as well. So our main goal is to provide you with all the support and advice and guidance that you need to make a flying start into your career in teaching. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming today. So my name's Simeon and I was a primary school teacher for around eight years. I did four years in a mixed year one, two class and then four years in a mixed three, four class. And before that, uh, I was a one-to-one -one and I worked also as a peripatetic music teacher. So I've been around education for a while. Uh, one of the best bits of my career was I got to train several teachers during my time and that was something I really enjoyed. I really felt passionate about. So I was very happy to come to Twinkle and work for the trainee teachers team and hopefully help some other trainees feel good and confident at the start of their careers. So um, I manage our Twitter, our Pinterest and um, our podcast as well with Ashley. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is how you can balance your coursework and your placements. So I'm sure now that you're maybe starting your second placements, the coursework might be, you know, quite heavy at the moment because, you know, you might be taking on a lot more teaching in your second placement. So we're just going to talk about how you can have that balance. So while you're on your placements, you're going to be expected to complete your coursework or assignments as well as teaching. And that is hard. Okay, it is challenging, but it is possible to actually to do both. So I'm going to give you some tips that helped me personally and the rest of us when we were in your in your place. And one of those things was time management. So a good idea would be to try and ensure that you're ahead of the game. So you know what assignments are going to be due when and you also know like kind of when you might be teaching as well and what you might be teaching. So a good idea would be is if you haven't already, which I'm sure you have, is get a diary and just kind of have all of those dates kind of just written down in your diary. So you're just ahead of the game and you know what's going on. Try to create a schedule as well. So say, for example, during the week, you've obviously got your planning to do and you've got an assignment to do as well. So try and create a schedule and try to stick to it of what you're going to be working on and when. And this will help you stay on track and avoid help you to avoid feeling overwhelmed. Another good idea that actually helped me personally was to set a deadline. So I said that, you know, by the end of the week, I'm going to try and complete this assignment or I'm going to try and have this much done of this assignment. And that actually really helped because I would be motivated or well, try to be as motivated as I could be and I'll avoid procrastinating because I know I've set a deadline for myself. And prioritize your tasks. So, sorry, Simin, do you want to say, do you want to say something? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I had a lot of trouble completing assignments and I got told something very similar. They mm -hmm. said put the end date on your calendar and then work backwards. How many weeks will you need to That's complete the assignment idea. and how much would you do each week? That's a really good idea. It really does help. Just setting that deadline and kind of just working backwards, it really helps to kind of just make sure that you're getting what needs to be done at the right time. So another good idea is to prioritize your tasks. So say, for example, you've got like a bunch of assignments that are due around the same time. So kind of maybe prioritize the one that's going to take the longest and which is the most important, which is the most urgent and, you know, and focus on those first. 
So being on the placement and at the same time as, a, as an assignment or coursework is due might actually benefit you. So from my experience, I remember when I was doing my PGCE, I actually had an assignment based on something to do with SCND. And I know that if I wasn't on placement at the time, I probably would have struggled to complete that assignment because I got a lot of help from the Senko in my, that, that was actually my second placement actually. And that, um, that Senko in, in my second placement really, really helped me. I went to her so much for advice and you know, kind of like case studies and that sort of thing. So it can actually help you. And there's a lot of members of staff that probably has a lot of knowledge on different aspects of what your assignments could be due on to kind of, could be um, based on so maybe use that as at your can't get my words out use that at your advantage so another thing to be aware of is that it can be it's actually really common to feel overwhelmed when there's a lot happening so I know a lot of us especially me I felt like how could I deal with this whole having placements having assignments to complete and it was really important that that I focused on myself and looked after my health because I noticed I was getting sick, I wasn't eating on time and that sort of thing. So try to schedule time for yourself and just make sure that you're looking after yourself at the same time. Like each week, try and do something that you enjoy, even if it's something as little as, you know, spending half an hour before you go to bed, just reading a book that you like or listening to music that you like, or maybe even playing a game that you like, something like that, you know, just it'll help you to recharge and relax as well. And one of the key things that, definitely you need to do is don't be afraid to ask for help like I know sometimes I just felt like asking for help will seem like I'm not managing or I can't do I can't do it or you know I'm finding it really hard but actually asking for help is one of the best things you can do because it will make sure sure that your tutor your mentor other support staff they're all there to help you succeed and if they know that you need help they're going to be more than willing to help you yes Simeon Sorry, I'd, I'd just like to echo no, that from working with trainees. One of the most common things is I, I wished you'd asked me sooner, you know. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd ask when a problem is small before mm -hmm. it gets bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Like no one will no one will say or be annoyed at the fact that you're asking a question. The fact that you're being maybe quite curious or quite intuitive, that sort of thing, it'll actually come across as a positive. So definitely ask questions if you need to. So we're just going to move on to how you can gather evidence for the teacher standards for your coursework. Um, so you must, you might be familiar with the teacher standards by now. So there are a set of guidelines that outline the expectations for teachers, professional practice, behavior, and conduct. So they're designed to ensure that teachers, are, teachers provide a high quality education for all of their students. And there's eight standards in total. So Harris just popped them in the chat as well. So you can refresh your memories if you haven't um, if you may have forgotten what they are so the whole point of the teacher standards and whilst you're doing your teacher training is that you are going to be assessed against them and it is a way that you will be assessed to see if you can reach QTS which is qualified teacher status so the best thing that you can do from this point onwards if you haven't already started is start gathering evidence for it and I'm going to tell you how you can do that so there are so many different ways that as trainee teachers that you can gather evidence for the teacher standards. Um, I'm just going to go through a few of them, but honestly, there are so many different creative ways that you can do it. So for things that you're already doing now, so lesson plans. So you've already started planning lessons. They're going to show clear and challenging learning objectives. And you're going to have, by the time that you've reached the middle of your second placement or even probably now you probably have a bunch of lesson plans that you could use that relate back to the teacher's standards so keep them as evidence make sure you've got copies of them even if it's a printed copy or an electronic copy just keep a copy of it because you can use it as evidence um, if you've had observations which i'm sure you have done by now um, from mentors or maybe from uh, your um, teacher training provider they may have came and come and observe you just keep those observation notes because it will show your progression as a teacher which is really important to keep because you can keep that as evidence assessment data as well so if you've done any sort of assessment so with your with your class so it could be something you know it could be like spelling tests or it could be like you know a end of term assessment it could be maybe even like a times table test something like that where you're consistently kind of assessing children that's actually really important as well it might not even be a test it could actually be 
success criteria, it could actually be marking as well, like photocopy, if you're allowed to make sure you check with your school. Um, if you're allowed to photocopy, um, maybe an example of way how you've marked a child's work, that can be used as evidence as well. Um, another good thing that you can use as evidence is participation in any CPD that you've done. So for example, if you went to an inset or maybe a staff meeting you've taken part in, or maybe you've even been to something, you know, through your local authority or something like that, they may have had some sort of training for you. Keep it all as evidence because that can be used for, I think it might be teaching standard eight. I think so, but I don't know from the top of my head. But um, also any evidence of any contributions to the school community. So for example, if you helped in the Christmas performance, that is really good evidence as well. So what you did, like how you helped, or maybe you did some practice with the children, or maybe you helped out in some sort of way, anything that you did for like maybe a class assembly or maybe a school trip, you might have helped out on a school trip, all of that can be used as evidence. And it's really important that you keep that all together. You can either use it, kind of, or put it into a journal or into a folder or anything really, just somewhere where you've got it all together because you're going to need that at some point where you start providing evidence for the teacher standards. Okay, so let's talk about developing a good relationship with parents. So when you're in your, when you're starting in a new placement, it can be quite hard because you've come in, you're someone different and you've come into your, come into a new school with a new class and the parents don't know you. They're already probably very familiar with the current adults that are in your, um, in your class and work with the children, but they don't know you. So we need to try and think about how you can develop a good relationship with them. So it's really important to, help, to try and build a strong relationship with the parents and guardians of the children in your class. So here are some tips of what you can do. So communicating regularly is really, really important. So, you know, depending on how your school works, if you do see the parents at the begin, beginning of the, day, of the day, make sure you're visible, make sure they can see you, that they see that you're present. Make sure at home time when when parents are coming to pick up their children that you're present there as well. So, you know, if they want to talk to you, if they want to get to know you, they've got an opportunity to ask you questions. They also all parents want parents want to know how their child is doing in school. So try to communicate with them. Like, you know, if you spot a parent, maybe you can say, that, oh, you know what? So and so had a really good day today or so and so did this. And they had like, you know, that are really they were playing really nicely at playtime. You know, tell them things about their child because they love to hear it. And also speak to your current class teacher about different ways that they're communicating with parents. Like maybe the school has something in place where they have like an emailing system or they have a text messaging system where you can send a quick message or something like that. And then you can just, you know, introduce yourself that sort of way. Um, another good thing is to be approachable and friendly. I'm sure I'm sure you all are. But, you know, when parents feel comfortable talking to you, they're more likely to reach out to you if they have any questions or concerns. So try to make an effort to get to know the parents because the more comfortable they feel, the more often they're going to come and speak to you. And that's how they'll trust you and they'll talk to you more. So some parents are going to come to you with concerns. That's very normal. So when they do come to you with concerns, try to address them professionally and also promptly. So try and be quick about it, because the longer you take, from my experience, parents feel like maybe like you're not you don't feel it's that important. The concern that they have so listen to their concerns and work with them to find a solution for the concern that they have as well and try to be positive and supportive so parents really appreciate teachers who have a positive attitude and who are really supportive of their children so if you if you talk to the parent and you tell them that like you know you believe in their child you know they can succeed so for example if a child has had a particularly bad day then if you tell you can tell them that don't just focus on like the negative things that happened that day, even though, if, well, if it was a really negative day, there might not be very many positive things to say, but you know, like the next day you can maybe pay attention to that child and think about something positive that they did that you can then relay back to the parent. Because if you keep talking about all the negative things all the time, then, you know, parents might get a little bit worked up over that. So it might be a really good idea to try and just focus on positive and negative feedback rather than just calling the same parent over and over again about negative things and try to be open to any questions the parents may have as well. Okay, I'm going to give it, pass it over to Simeon now and he's going to talk to you about group work.
Uh, cool. I, I just wanted to add on the end, Matisha, there that I completely agree with you about staying positive. Um, when you do have to bring up something negative, I think it's very helpful to go in with a plan. So we've mm -hmm. identified this issue. Here's what we'd like to do to support your child. And that that's, you know, a much nicer place yeah. to go from than yeah. just there's an issue. Yeah, 100%. Um, have, have a plan in place of, OK, this happened today, but we're going to try and avoid this happening tomorrow. And this is what we're going to do to try and avoid this happening and trying yeah. to make things better. I think that's a great idea. Yeah. And then quite often the parent will ask if there's anything they can do to help as well. Yeah. And then it's it's like Definitely. a partnership, which is yeah much nicer. OK, um, so I thought I'd start off my session with one of my favourite um, aspects of teaching, which is group work. And I've started with a few questions, I'm afraid. Um, so you don't have to answer, but it will really help the session if you would be generous enough to give an answer. You don't have to say anything, but if you'd like to type something in the chat, that would be really good. Um, so just why is group work important and what do we need to consider it as teachers when either we're planning groups or when we're working with a group? What are some things we might need to think about? And I'll um, give everyone a, a minute or so just to think about that. I know, I know there's a bit of an awkward silence, but I think it's it's good if we can all contribute a bit. Absolutely, oh, straight on it, Louisa. Group size, the relationships between the children. Yeah, are, is this group actually going to be able to work together, especially if there's not an adult? present yeah SEND absolutely collaboration of ideas yeah is, is it going to be a collaborative group or is one child going to end up doing everything yeah absolutely friendship groups relationships um ooh, grouping get oh so sort of ways of creating groups on the spot that's a nice one I think that's what you mean by grouping games let me know if I'm wrong Yeah, because um, children can be very canny, can't they? Uh, I, I've seen it in PE lessons where children somehow always arrange it so they're next to their best friend, no matter how many games you play to split them up. Yeah, so I, th I think those are all really, yeah, absolutely, Harriet. Turn taking and learning to listen to other people's ideas. And you might need to plan in some time for that if group work's not going the way you want. Planning in like a five minute warm up activity about how we take turns and listen to people might actually save you time in the long run over a half term. Yes, play games, but we are grouping, actually we are grouping them. I've seen them space themselves out if I'm counting groups of three so they're in the same group too. Well, it's I've good, they're doing maths. If they're, if they're doing that, they're doing maths. But yeah, so you might you might want to think about how tightly you want to control these groups. Group work was one of my favourite things because that's when I felt I got to do some really effective teaching. I really liked working with a group of six or eight children. So that's, that's why I went for this. Um, so some things I picked up in my career were... Even, even when you're in a small group, I think it's really good to set out expectations for how you want this particular group to work, because group work can be very free and easy, or it can be quite tight and controlled. So I think it's good to talk about that with the children. And if there's resources on the table, how do you want those to be used for a grouping jar? That's nice. Um, yeah, is it? it's hopefully not going to be a free for all with everyone grabbing. Hopefully it's going to be nice and controlled. That the learning's discussed up front and everyone's taking turns and sharing and listening to each other. If you get the chance to work with a small group, it's quite nice to have a whiteboard or something so you can scaffold and model as you go. I had this mini one with a handle I used to carry around with me and it was honestly my favourite bit of kit in the whole classroom because I knew if I, if I ever needed to suddenly take out a group and explain something, I could do it with this whiteboard and a pen. Um, and Again, it's it, it's worth taking an extra five minutes to really go through something at the start of a group session. Make sure everyone's happy before you set people off or alternatively let people have a quick go and then go over it again with the people who need the help and everyone who's confident can have a go themselves. 
Okay. Um, I also think group work's a great way to cut down on your workload potentially because you can live mark as you go. And if you have a TA, you can also encourage them to live mark their groups. Obviously, you'll still look at the work at the end, but that will hopefully cut down on your workload a bit. Right, so um, behaviour management's a huge topic for teachers and coming into a second placement, uh, especially if you're going into a different school, it, it will be an important topic for you. Um, so again, if everyone wouldn't mind, well, not you don't have to, but if as many people as possible wouldn't mind sharing one behaviour management tip you've learned so far in the chat. It can be anything big or small. Learn names early. Yeah. Oh, and revise the behaviour policy. That's interesting. I definitely agree with you on learning names. People love the sound of their own name. Uh, it's, if you ask someone something with their name, they're much more likely to pay attention to it. I definitely agree with you, Louise, in terms of revising the behaviour policy, especially if you're starting your second placement, because schools are schools are different and they might have certain things in place that you need to follow. So it's really good that you just what because the behaviour policy that you followed in your first placement might not necessarily be the behaviour policy in your second placement. So really good advice there. Oh, and silence and voice up. Yeah, I mean, if you like a silent working atmosphere, I don't know how, how realistic that is for a whole lesson, but if you like periods of silence in your lessons, absolutely. Um, you might have to spend some time rehearsing to get that, but I, th I think that can be a really beneficial thing. I always found if I wanted the class to be quiet, it didn't always work, but say if we were doing like a big write or something, sometimes I'd play like really soft music and yeah, that would help too. with the noise level and would help with behaviour because it would just yeah. keep everyone kind of focused and concentrated and we'd use really, really small whisper voices and that was just something that we just stuck with. It was an expectation of that whenever we're doing this particular type of um, lesson that we would have music on, and whisper voices and that's what help with behavior i think that's really good and you also have an inbuilt um kind of monitor there if we can't hear the music then it's, yeah. it's too loud you know that you're being too loud yeah exactly. oh harriet that i completely agree with you on this one so consider why the behavior is happening is there an unmet need and um, that's something I, i've got on my slides for later uh, we know that behavior is usually a symptom of maybe an unmet need or, or something that's not quite right. So I'll get into my tips, but if anyone's got any more, oh yeah, praise positive behavior, you get more of what you praise, so, or what you focus on, so definitely praise the positive first if you can. Um, so I'll get into my tips, but if you have more, drop them in the chat. I'd love to see them. Um, so um, one, of, one of the things that really helped me was when I started planning for behaviour management. And that, that's a tip I got from a, a head teacher I knew. And that means thinking about the little things, the things like, well, how do the children move off the carpet to their tables? How are they getting the resources? out how are the books handed out how are they collected up at the end of the lesson all these little things where behavior can become an issue if you've got good systems for that in place and you're planning ahead for those moments or how they come back in after break time those kind of things yeah it's a little bit more planning but it will make your life easier and save you time in the long run um, engagement's another thing. Once I started thinking of engagement as a form of behaviour management, that really helped me because children who are enjoying the lesson, interested in what you're saying, and who can actually access the work at their level are much less likely to misbehave because they're engaged. Um, and it, it sounds a bit mean to say, but sometimes bad behaviour happens because just the work isn't the right level for the child. Maybe it's too easy or too difficult or just the material isn't being presented in a way that's engaging for them. And as teachers, it's on us to see if we can adapt to their needs in some way. Um, 
And then as Harriet's already pointed out, behaviour, challenging behaviour, that is, um, can be a symptom of an underlying issue. Maybe there's something happening at home or an unmet need or the child's feeling a certain way. And by taking some time to get to know that child, spending some time with them, learning about what they like, what they're interested in, you will have a much better chance of sort of dealing with that challenging behaviour and hopefully doing it in a way that's kind of a partnership with that child. Okay, so observations. Um, so Ashley and I have just recorded a podcast on lesson observations. That's when you're being observed. That will come out this month, so look out for that one. Uh, I, I was actually thinking here about observing other teachers as a way to improve our practice. Um, so I think it's one of the most valuable things you can have the opportunity to do as a teacher observing someone else. I think it's really important when you do, you're very respectful, um, you say some nice things. E even teachers who've been in the game for 30 years uh, can be insecure about letting someone else see them teach. It's a stressful thing even for them. So it's really important. Um, you know, we're respectful to our colleagues and uh, we, we give them some positives and thank them afterwards. Um, they'll, they'll also appreciate being asked their opinion and questions on how to deal with things. But um, by observing other teachers, you get to magpie things. And I often think good teachers are basically magpies. We just steal the best bits from everything, everyone we see. Um, so do you have any tips or ideas you learn specifically from watching another teacher? And I'll open this up to the trainee teachers team as well. Sometimes I find when, when I was watching other teachers, more experienced teachers, is sometimes it's just their behavior management. I really benefited from watching because sometimes they can just have, especially in the early days, like I always wondered about, you know, the teacher look. And, yeah. and some really experienced teachers will just have a look and that is literally it that's and i always wanted to i don't know if i ever did i, I feel maybe i did but i feel like you know that once you develop that kind of look that it comes with time as well and just other little behavior management strategies that you might just to, um, pick up so i think it's a really good thing like even though you're watching like the lesson like and you're watching how they're teaching but just like pick up on try to focus on those little things as well like what might they be doing where might they be standing or, you know, are they standing at yeah. the front of the classroom, maybe at the side? Like, and why are they standing there? Is there a reason? Or, you know, if there's a low level disruption, what are they doing to, they might not even be addressing it like verbally. They might just, you know, put their hand on, on, the, ta on the desk of that child who is, um, may, might have a little bit of low level disruption. So just little things like that you can pick up on by observing another teacher, which is really good. Yeah, absolutely. I, I knew this year six teacher. She loved Shakespeare and she was very dramatic. Eng English teaching was her absolute favourite. And she would walk around the classroom doing all these gestures and things. And I, I assumed that that was just like her personality. She was just like a dramatic person with lots of energy who liked to walk around. And she um, told me one day, no, no, I do that to keep them on their toes. So they're always looking at me. And I was like, oh, right. Yeah, so, it's really good, isn't it? Because you wouldn't think yeah. to do that. You'd think, oh, I'm just going to stand at the front of the classroom and that's where I teach from, where the whiteboard is. But actually, you can actually. teach from anywhere in the classroom, really, can't you? You can, yeah. And going for a stroll is, is a good way to get people's attention. Yeah, 100%. Um, yeah. I, I think experienced teachers and behaviour management, it's a little bit like a swan. You know, it looks very calm on top and we don't see the legs working underneath, but they're usually doing a lot of things we, we might not see. And, uh, right away. Oh, keeping a little notepad and a page for each child, write notes through the year ready for reports. That is a really good tip. That's a brilliant tip. Yeah. Because um, uh, if you're anything like me, you'll discover there's sort of uh, three or four children who are just very nice and quiet and get on. And when you get to report time, you don't have much to say apart from they're nice and quiet and get on. And I like them. But, you know, you need, you need a bit more than that to write a report. Um, Right, so reflection, this is a huge one we know, um, but if you can take a bit of time every week to reflect on your progress in a kind, positive way, be kind to yourself, uh, make sure you're looking at the good things you did. So it's like that 
blank page with a spot of ink on it make sure you're not just focused on the one thing that went wrong make sure you're looking at the whole page um and set goals for yourself personal goals that you can tick off that you feel you've achieved them and that might just be i'm going to talk to such and such a, a staff member or i'm going to ask a question at the staff meeting or i'm going to get to know this amount of people or i'm going to learn my children's names just things like that so you can feel you're making progress and it's great to keep looking back at those teachers standards and just see if there's anything you need to work on and um cpd louise will know the cpd team here have a lot of fantastic free resources and sessions you can try out just like this one they're videoed you can just watch them uh, and try them at your convenience okay so um thank you so much for listening so well to us if you have any questions please drop them in the chat and we will be happy to try and answer them for you